book of First Peter this morning. The book of First Peter this morning. Um, Peter has been talking about and using a lot of different stuff to talk about the church and describing the church and describing what we should be as the church. And here he's going to talk about, um, in these verses following down, he's going to talk about something that is really, really hard to do. And um, it's submission. It's submitting. And so it, it's kind of like Peter is letting us know that, and this is really hard, especially in America, right? Because we have so many freedoms. We have so many freedoms, so submission to us is really hard. It's really something foreign to us. We like to do things our own way. We like to have things our own way. We like to make our own way. You know, so like, that's what we're used to. But then when you become a child of God, when you become a Christian, you know, you're owned by Christ. You're God. And let me tell you something. When he talked in the previous verses from the one we'll read this morning, he was talking about us being pilgrims and strangers in this land. And that reminded us that we were not citizens of this world, but we are citizens of heaven. So as citizens of heaven and children of God, God is describing through Peter how we should conduct ourselves here on earth. And one of the things that he speaks to us about is submission to those in authority over us. And that could be really hard. Because, right, I mean, like, it's, it's really probably kind of cool and easy when it's somebody you like. Or when it's a person you like. Or when it's a situation you like. I mean, that can make it really easy, right? But what about when it's not? What about whenever it's not the person you like that's in authority over you? What about whenever that person, that boss, may not be the person they should be? What about, you know, when the president or the senator or the governor or whoever it may be is not the person that, you know, they should be? How, you know, what is it that is so hard about that? You know, and, and so we're going to talk about this morning the secret to submission. The secret to submission. I think it's something worthy of your time. I think it's something worthy of your attention. Because God said if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, He will lift us up. And so you got to remember this morning that what we're talking about is humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord. you got to remember this morning that when we submit ourselves to the authorities here on earth and place ourselves under the authorities here on earth, that we're, I mean, in the end, what we are really doing is submitting ourselves to God and doing what God has told us to do. And that's what helps me to be able to do that, is knowing that God has commanded me to do it as a Christian person and a citizen of heaven. And so when I do that, I'm really submitting to him. And he sees all things, and he knows all things, and he hears all things. So he sees if I'm treated wrongly. He sees if I'm enduring suffering and persecution to submit to that. And he'll make it right. Eternally, he'll make it right. And the other thing is, he's a perfect judge. But the other thing is, listen, we have all eternity to enjoy what we do here in this short time on earth. So no matter what it is you endure in doing this and submitting to the authority over us and following the word of God, you know that God will bless you eternally for what you do here on this earth. And it's a small amount of time that we have here to glory, you know, bring glory to God in this life compared to what we're going to enjoy throughout all eternity. So we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep that in mind. So um, we've got to stand in our reverence reading God's word. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but considered, uh, committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, that we, now listen to me, if you're a born again believer, if you've been saved, you're in this we. That we, being dead to sin, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Lord, I pray you bless the reading and the preaching of your word. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. And we can feel that love this morning, Lord. We can feel the Spirit of God moving in his place. And we pray you have your will in your way for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. So I know I, if those of you that are here week to week and listen, the really cool thing about 2024 is if you're new here this week or just come, you can go back and listen to all the previous sermons going through 1 Peter and catch up with what went on before now. 
But if, I, you can, if you're with me every week, you understand, you write down where I preach every week, you understand I skip some verses. The reason I skip those verses, I was talking about them being under the authority, you know, of the people here on earth and the different scenarios that the Bible lays out about that is because I think, first of all, we need to understand how we're going to do it. We need to understand how we're going to do it because once you figure out how you can do it, then I believe it makes it much easier to learn what he says about those things and you're not defensive the whole time. I don't know how you are about things, but when it's somebody telling me something I don't want to do, like my defenses go up. And I immediately start thinking about reasons I can't do it. And ways out of it. I don't know, it's just human in me, I guess, you know? So we're all human like that. So I think it's really good for you to understand that you can do it before we talk about what you need to do. And so here I'm going to talk about a, a Greek word called proneo. And it means to exercise the mind, that is to entertain or have a sentiment or opinion by implication, to be merely disposed, more or less earnestly in a certain direction. Intensively to interest oneself in, to set your affection on, to be of the same mind, regard, or thinking. That's what God wants too. When you read these verses that I just read, and you read about how Jesus suffered and died and was the ultimate example to us and to what we should be doing. God wants us to have the same mindset that Jesus had when he walked on this earth towards his heavenly father. Because you've got to understand that when it, the Bible speaks about Jesus' example, that Jesus was God. Jesus was God. He wasn't created in Mary's womb. He was transferred and he was placed in Mary's womb. But he has existed forever. There's God the Son and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. Three persons in one. And you can read in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word with God. And in verse 14 it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among men. He was pre-existent before that moment he was placed in Mary's womb. But literally from the moment he was placed in Mary's womb, from the moment he took his first steps, to the time he took his last steps on earth, before he ascended back to heaven. He was an example for us. He was an example for us. When it comes to this, when it comes to submission, because Jesus being equal to God the Father and equal to uh, the Holy Spirit, placed himself, submitted himself under the authority of God the Father while he was here on this earth. He said many times he came to do the works of his Father and bring glory to his Father. So you can see the pure submission of God while he was here on this earth, the example that he gave. Because I'm going to tell you one of the main things when I come across this scripture that hit me, you know, you, got, you, get, you just get to thinking about it, right? You just get to thinking about it. I mean, you think about, why should I have to do that? Why should I have to do that? Why should I have to submit to those people? Why should I do that here? And then I think to myself, and when I read this, when I got down to the bottom, see, as I read through the verses I let, that I skipped that we're going to go back to next week, when I got down to the bottom, these scriptures here, because Jesus did. Jesus did. Jesus did. He was the perfect example. And we need to have that same mindset. This must be our model. This mind must be in us. In proportion as we become humbled and crucified, we in our small measure shall attain the power of blessing and saving me and every mind. When I look in those scriptures that I just read about the example of Jesus, there's three main things that stuck out to me when you look at the example of Jesus. Why he was here on this earth. You see that he was humble. You see he was humble. You see the second thing I see is he was obedient. Even unto the death of the cross. He was humble and he was obedient. And listen, he was crucified. I'm telling you, if you're going to submit yourself to authority, one thing that's got to happen is you've got to be crucified. And I don't mean we've got to drag you out back and physically crucify you. Just like that baptism was symbolism, it, it's symbolic talk. It's illustrative talk. But your flesh inside of you does not want to bow before anyone. And as long as your flesh is strong and your spirit is weak, 
Until you crucify, crucify your flesh, you won't be able to humble yourself. And because you can't humble yourself, you won't be able to be obedient. And because you're not obedient, you can't live a crucified life. And let me just tell you what, what I tried to do when I first got saved. Many of you are young believers in here today. Many of you are just starting to try to live the Christian life, right? i tell you what I did. I said, you know what? I'm just going to beat it back. I like some parts of it. Come on now. I like some parts of it. I just want to kill the parts I don't like. Oh, I agree with you, God. Let's kill them parts I don't like. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? You know one part I really like? Is when somebody come at me, I would go at them. I really like that part. I really had a hard time and still have a hard time killing that part. But you can't just beat it back. You can't just play with your food. Brother, you gotta kill it. You gotta kill it all. Your flesh has gotta die. There's no way to live the Christian life and submit yourself under the authority of God in any kind of way without killing your flesh. And some of you, listen to me, some of you, some of you have tried. You say that you wouldn't say this, you say, I tried everything that the Bible says. I tried what they say at church. And it didn't work for me. Let me tell you something. I promise you it'll work 100% of the time. But you got to go all in. You got to kill it. That old man, listen to me. That old man, hey, some of y'all, some of y'all say you tried, but you kept him on life support just in case. Amen? That's right. I don't know if being serious. You know what I mean? Now, you women are like, tickle me. Like y'all, y'all make me laugh. It's so funny, like watching y'all interact when it's a negative way. Because y'all are so nice about it using. And it's so undetected. You know what I mean? Like 20,000 dudes could be sitting there watching three women talk and they could all be jabbing one another and not one of them dudes would know they did it. You know what I mean, ladies? You just want to keep it on the back burner. Just in case old Sally, and if your name is Sally, I'm not referring to you. <laughs> just in case old Sally ain't nice. You know what Jesus did? You know what he's talking about, though, when, it, when he submitted to God? Let me just tell you something. Jesus made this statement. Please don't miss the statement that Jesus made. He said, no man took his life. That is super important. He was not forced to change. He was not forced to change. He became sin. Who knew no sin. Willingly, he said, I lay down my life. He said, no man takes it from me. He said, I've not been forced into this. As he lay beaten and bloody from the beating he took. As he lay there mocked and spit dripping off of him where they spit in his face. He laid his hands down on the cross. Willingly. And he did it for the glory of the Father. And he did it because he loves you. And so if you've tried and you failed... There's some part, some place that you left alive with the old man. There's something you refuse to kill. Or listen to me, maybe you were guilted into it. You ever seen people like that? Like, like listen, man, I've been preaching for a long time. So, I watch people sometimes, and sometimes preachers manipulate words to push people into doing something. Whether it be an invitation or whatever it may be. Anything that a man can push you into, the devil can push you out of. 
But I tell you what, I preach not my best sermon sometimes, or not being not being on like I you know tried to be, and it felt like a failure that day. And praise God, somebody willingly came and gave their life to Christ and let the old man die. There's a big difference between a man you force to do something and a man who willingly does it. The man who's forced to do it because of guilt or because of shame or because of fear, he does it like drudgery. But the man who willingly does it, does so haphazardly, he doesn't ask the cost. He doesn't care what happens to him and his old life because he's done with it. He's done with it. He's like Jesus when he's hanging on the cross. And he said, it's finished. My old life is finished. I ain't going back there, Lord willing. I don't want anything to do with my old life. I hate that old person I was. I don't want to revive him. I can't stand him. The sight of my old man and who I was disgusts me. That I would say the things I said. That I would do the things that I did. That I would be that kind of a man. And lay down and sleep at night. I hate that guy. He's still in there, though. He's still in there. And I've been saved for a long time. And there's some people in here been saved longer than me. They got more gray hair or no hair. You get what I mean? <laughs> They'll tell you the same thing I'm fixing to tell you. That if you're going to submit yourself daily to God, you got to kill that old man daily. Every morning you wake up, you got to go to war with the flesh. you got to go to war with the devil. You gotta go to war with the world. And let me just tell you something the world is really, really stinking hard to go to war with. Because everything in your flesh loves what's in the world. It's the world system. Why? Because worldly people love it. It's the world system. It pleases our flesh. The things in it are not of God. That's why, listen, Jesus, through James, through the book of James, he said that if you are a friend of the world, that you are an enemy of God. So you cannot do both at the same time. And then you take the devil. Some of you think, some of you think you're just having a good time. You're just doing your thing. Listen, listen to me now. Listen to me. You know the reason the world's in a wreck? Because dad ain't being the men they're supposed to be. That's 100% of the reason. And you think you're just doing your thing. You think nobody knows it, nobody sees it. You ain't heard anything. All you've done, whether you realize it or not, is made a deal with the devil. And you open the door for the devil to be in your heart, and you're whole. And you always have to pay. You always have to pay. If it's lying, let me just tell you something. The truth will bend. You can bend the truth. But you know what it's going to do? It's going to pop back into place. If it's something illicit, something sexual, you cannot lay down. Whether it be physically with a woman or virtually with a woman and not be burned. It's going to cost you something. And so you have to battle the world, you have to battle the devil. But I tell you what, that ain't the hardest foe I've fought. The hardest foe I've fought is in that mirror. He looks back at me in that mirror. And I don't recognize him sometimes because I remember him as skinny, dark hair. A brown mustache. I mean, I'm just saying. I don't know how my wife used me, but I hope she still sees me like when we were 19 and got married. I don't know. It probably depends on how nice I am. She's wanting to say something. I'll hear it when I get home. 
Uh, you got me interested now, baby. I, I want to know what you think. If don't say it right now, you wait till we get to the house. But um, where was I? okay, okay. But you've got to find that guy in the mirror. You can't keep feeding. You cannot keep feeding. You cannot keep giving in to him. You cannot keep listening to him and say one more day, one more time, one more minute. You got to kill him. He's got to die. And if you want to serve God today, he's got to die today. Let me just tell you something. Men not being the men of God is supposed to be has wrecked our world. But listen, let me tell you something. People are burning in hell right now because of themselves. You say, what do you mean by that? That man they seen in the mirror? Listen, that flesh inside of the people in hell? You know what many of the people in hell heard from their flesh while they were sitting in the church pew? Under better preaching than this. In a better place, whatever you want to say. I guarantee you there's people in hell that sat under Adrian Rogers and Jerry Vines, Mike Brunson, E.V. Hill. And you know who they listened to? They didn't listen to the word of God and the messenger of God. It was not somebody in the pew beside them that talked them out of giving their life to Christ and becoming a citizen of heaven and avoiding hell. It was literally that man they see in the mirror. And they could have, they could have literally, I know I use that word a lot, they could have literally sat in the pew today on Sunday, been convicted to come and give their life to Christ, and the old man, the flesh inside of them said, we'll do that later. We got some more fun to have. I got some more stuff planned out for me and you. We got time. And then he opened his eyes in hell and tore me. There's no escape. There's no way out. Once you die, it's over. And let me tell you something. That the world and the devil and your flesh will tell you that's a lie. They'll tell you where you're going to die, it ain't going to matter anyway. Let me just tell you something. You may physically die momentarily, but you don't die eternally. Nobody does. You are going to be living somewhere in eternity. And there's only two places. One is heaven and the other is hell. So even before you can submit to the authority of man and live out a Christian life, the first thing you've got to do is come and submit yourself to God and be saved. And then the moment you're saved, God starts steering you and changing you and correcting you and making you more like your son Jesus. Now I want you to look at this. I want you to think about this. The first thing we need to do is look at Jesus. Like I just said, look at his example. Look at who he was. Look at what he was doing. That mind in Christ, that mind that Jesus had, that attitude he had, that's the attitude we need to have in living his life. We need to be humble, obedient, and crucified. The second thing we must do is we must place our trust in Jesus. 1 Peter 2.25, it says this, For you are a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Every lost man in this building, and listen, saved man, you were admitting me telling him he needed to come and put his trust in Jesus. But every saved man, woman, boy, and girl in this place, we also need to continually put our trust in Jesus with our lives. That's how we can submit to the authorities over us. That's how we can submit ourselves to people we may not like, to things we may not like, or we may not enjoy. For the glory of God, we can do it because we trust the Good Shepherd. Because ultimately I'm in the hands of God, and if he allows something to go on with me as a child of God, then I know it's got a reason. I know it's for something or somebody. Listen to what John said in John 10. This is the person I'm asking you to trust this morning. 
Verily, verily, I say to you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door, thank God for him that entereth by the door. It's a shepherd of the sheep. It's a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the porter opened up to the sheep, hear his voice. Man, I thank God for his voice today. I thank God when I've been at my worst. Even as a Christian person. Even as a saved man. That the, the voice of Jesus would cry out in the sin I was in. And I could hear his voice calling me home to him. He didn't save me to leave me in sin. He didn't save you to leave you in sin. If you're saved and you fell off in sin, you listen to the voice of the good shepherd. He knows the sheep. Listen to what it says. And when he put it forth his own sheep, he go up before them. Jesus ain't asking you to do anything he hasn't done. And he goes before you. He knows every step you're going to take and everything that's going to happen along that way. You, you remember that when you're walking through darkness that Jesus went ahead of you. That Jesus knows where you are. That the good shepherd is just a prayer away. And when he put it forth his own sheep, he goes before them and his sheep follow him where they know his voice. I'm telling you, you in here today and you say that you fell away from God, listen to his voice. How sweet is his voice? How sweet is it to hear the voice of the good shepherd? How sweet is it for the God of the universe to not pour out judgment upon us because we've given our life to him and been gloriously saved. But because of his son, Jesus Christ gives us grace and mercy. This parable, Jesus spake unto them, but they understood not what things which they were spoken to them. Then Jesus said to them, John 10, said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say to you, I am the door to sheep. All that ever come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. In John 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That if you'll come to Christ, you shall be saved. And if you're saved, even if you're going through tough times today, he's not forgotten you. He knows exactly where you are. He's went ahead of you. And he's walking with you. Even through the darkness. Even through the hard times. Even through the hurt, the pain. And it's like he said in 1 Peter, he binds up the broken and the hurt. And he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You know today if you're lost that Jesus gave, gave his life for you? That he didn't want to see you suffer the punishment of your own sin. Let me just tell you something. You deserve that punishment. Just because I'm saved don't mean I don't deserve the punishment. But he loved me. He loved you so much that he took your place. It was a vicarious death. What that means is that it was, he substituted himself for us. So when you see what Jesus endured, that was what we had come. And the reason you can never leave hell is we can never pay the price or the wages of sin. We can never pay enough to make up for what we've done in one sin. One sinful moment, we deserve hell for eternity. But Jesus, Jesus, because he's perfect and he's God, left heaven and substitutionarily died on the cross for us. He took your pain, he took your shame, he took your hurt. Isn't it only right for us to live for him? Isn't it only right for us to submit to him? For us to follow him, to walk in his steps, to follow his voice. But it's not going to be like his forever. The Bible says he's a, a shepherd, but also a bishop or an overseer of your soul. Listen to what Ezekiel said in chapter 34, speaking to Israel. For thus saith the Lord God, 
Behold, I am I. Both will search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among the sheep that are scattered. So I will seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. God knows the days are dark. God knows you feel lost and turn around. He knows how rough it is on you right now. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture. And upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There they shall lie in a good fold and a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down. Saith the Lord God, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken. I will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with the judgment. And here he's speaking about the great day when he will return. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 19 it says that when the marriage supper of the Lamb is over, when we as Christian people and born again believers, a part of the church, have sat down with our Lord and celebrated. When he's finished, when he's finished, we will exit heaven and make our way back to earth. But it's going to be different than it is now. He came as a suffering servant. He'll return as a conquering king. It says in Revelation 19, And he saith unto me, Right, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we are blessed if you are saved today. Can I get an amen, in church? Amen. We are blessed. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am their final servant and brethren and have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then he says some of the greatest words of my ears have ever heard. He describes something that I can't wait for. He describes a moment that I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning thinking about and imagining my mind as I laid in bed and got ready for this day and to preach this morning. He said this. He said, I saw heaven open. Heaven's just going to open up. And behold, a white horse. That white horse was what Roman conquerors would ride down the main street of town on. It signified triumph. Oh, it may be bad today, but it won't be then. Not if you're saved. Not if you're saved. Now, if you ain't saved, this, this is not your story. This is not your song. You've got a whole different view of this eternally. But if you're saved and born again today, it says that and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. And this is the part I love so much. This is my favorite part of the whole thing. His eyes were a thing of a flame of fire. I just imagine Jesus sitting on that white horse. I can't imagine how the apostle John, as he was given his vision. He walked the earth with Jesus as, a, as a, a mortal man. But here in this moment, he seen his eyes like flames of fire. And me as a sinful man that disappoints God, that gets disgusted in my, with myself when I sin, I imagine this moment and I cry out to God in my heart when I think about it. Oh God, let me look into your eyes of fire. Please let the flame of your righteousness burn away all my sin, all my wrong thoughts, all my wrong motives. Let it burn away everything that's not like you. In that day, on his head were many crowns. And on that day, he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And on that day he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And if you don't study these words out, these scripture out, you'll just think naturally that that's the blood of Christ 
from the cross. But the blood, listen, the blood on that garment he has on will be the blood of his enemies. And some of you sit here today unknowingly, you are the enemy of God. He said that you're either for me or against me. And if you're not saved, you're lost. And if you're not saved, you're not a friend of God. You're not a child of God. If you're lost, you're the enemy of God. And a, a man of war, when he had won, when he had vanquished his enemies, would wear that garment dipped in blood. It's blood of his enemies. So just imagine he'll ride in with his eyes flaming like fire on a great white horse with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That just makes me happy I come to Sunday school. Amen? The Word of God is so powerful that literally when Jesus comes to take down his enemies, it will come out of his mouth like a spear and pierce every enemy just through the power of the Word. His Word. And out of his mouth, no, and the armies, I can't forget this part, which were in heaven, followed upon him white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes the sharp sword, and it should be smite the nations, and shall rule with the rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh, and he written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is calling you today. Jesus himself is calling you today. He's calling for every saved man to continue to kill his old man and submit himself to God. And if you failed at that, my friend, you need to come and ask God to forgive you. And you need to get your heart back right with God. But the voice of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is also crying out to every lost man in his place. I don't know if you're going to come and give your life to Jesus today or not. You probably sat in a service like this before and walked out lost as you can be. Knowing where you was headed. And I preach my heart out today. I may not speak good English. I may not be the brightest guy around. But I preach my heart out today. I did my dead level best. You heard enough about my Lord and how gracious and good He is to come and be saved today. And so if you open your eyes in hell one day, you'll remember this moment. So my friend, if you're lost today, please, 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 come. Because a good shepherd's calling. And he wants to love on you. He don't want to condemn you. The Bible says that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So you can come today, not because of anything good you've done, not because of anything you have, but just because of Jesus Christ, you can come and be saved today. And you don't need to worry about cleaning up and getting right, because there ain't no way to do it. It's an impossibility. You just got to come just as you are, like the old hymn says. Just as you are, without one belief. Just as you are. And give yourself to God. And He'll accept you. If you really mean it and you really do it, He'll accept you. And He'll help you to change. So you can't get right before you come. You just got to come. And listen, it's like I said. I'm not going to push you into something the devil will push you out of. But I am up here telling you with a loving heart that I'd love to see you come be saved today. And I know it might be scary, it might be nerve wracking, but I can tell you I've been sitting right where you are, feeling the same way you feel it. 
when I got out of that pew and I took the first step, God just took care of the rest. That's all you got to do this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, you know how I was just laying in my bed this morning. Five o'clock in the morning, just wide awake. And I thought about your eyes and how they burn. And I thought about how I'd be riding on one of those horses behind you. And how fun that would be. But I also thought about that great white throne, Lord. That after all that's done and you reign for a thousand years, that every lost man is going to stand before you and be condemned to the lake of fire. And I know there's going to be some people I love, some people I care about, that don't come and aren't saved. But I pray that ain't so today here. I pray by your power, by your spirit, that everybody here is being saved today. I don't know if they will, Lord. If they got free will, I don't know if they'll listen to you. But it's my prayer that they will. And I know you're doing all, all that you're going to do up to make them. And that's my prayer today, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray it. In the name above every name. Amen. Y'all stand and come as God leads you this morning, okay? As Mark plays, the guys, if y'all coming up, buddy, you guys, well, he's already up here.